Good evening. We would like to welcome everyone to the Gray's Disease um, Awareness Webinar hosted by the American Associative Endocrine Surgeons, AES, and in participation with the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. I am Joy Shen, an endocrine surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm one of tonight's moderators. Hi, and I'm Dr. Sarah Holtman at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, and I'll be our other night's moderator. We have an, an assembled and expert panel to discuss and answer your common questions about Graves' disease, and tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the AAES Facebook page and YouTube channel within the next week. We'd like to thank the Graves' Disease and Thyroid Foundation for providing us with frequently asked questions from their membership. If time permits, we will also be taking live questions from the audience this evening. You can enter your questions into the comment section directly on the Facebook live stream. Please be aware that we will not be answering any personal medical questions or providing specific medical advice. For those types of questions or requests, please seek advice from your doctor or medical team. We'll start by introducing our expert panel. First, we have Dr. David Cooper, who is an endocrinologist at the Johns Hopkins Medical Center. We also have Dr. Raymond Douglas, an oculoplastic surgeon at Cedar sinai Medical Center. We also have Dr. Rachel Kells, an endocrine surgeon at Penn Medicine. And lastly, but surely not least, Dr. Joe Sharma, another endocrine surgeon at the Emory University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you for all of our panelists. Um, Dr. Cooper, um, our first question is gonna be directed to you. What are the pros and cons of the long-term use of methismazole versus the use of radioactive iodine or surgery? And how long should a patient be treated with medication before definitive treatment is considered? Well, first I wanna thank the AAS for asking me to join you today. And um, I'm the only non-surgeon on the panel, so I feel privileged to be able to speak to, the, uh, to you about this uh, question. So um, I think, First of all, we all have to agree that there's no perfect treatment for Graves' disease. Someday, I think in the future, there will be more specific treatments that get at the actual cause of Graves' disease, which is obviously an immunological problem. And uh, But right now, all we have are the treatments that have been used for you know, at least 70 or 80 years. We have antithyroid drug therapy that were introduced in the mid-1940s, radioactive iodine also introduced in the 1940s, and then surgery, of course, which is the oldest treatment that has been going on for, you know, more than a century or, you know, much longer than that, 150 years, perhaps. And um, because these treatments do not address the actual root cause of Graves' disease, which is, an, you know, an autoimmune problem, none of them really are perfect. Um, in this country, antithyroid drugs are the most commonly used uh, of the three treatments, um, but radioactive iodine and surgery are certainly other uh, treatments that are totally effective. And it really, uh, in large part, depends on the patient's own personal preferences about what they think is the most important uh, factors that go into a choice. And I think for, for the patients out there, I just wanna say that if you have a doctor that's telling you what you have to do, you should go to a different doctor. You should be able to make this choice yourself, unless there's some overriding medical reason why one treatment or another is the right choice for you in, in this doctor's opinion. But if, if it's just up to you know cho choosing between these three, you need to be able to make your voice heard and make your preferences known. And I will say that when surveys have been done and uh, studies have been published, about what patients really care about when they're choosing the treatment for Graves' disease, the main thing they care about is the possibility that at some point it may go away. They may have what's called a remission. Now, you know, this is a dream sometimes, and, you know, uh, obviously in many cases it doesn't happen, but there's always this hope that maybe at some point the person will be able to stop taking methimazole and they will be in remission and they won't have to be on any medicine at all. And that dovetails into the idea that many patients have that they do not want to be on lifelong levothyroxine therapy. Uh, the reasons for this are numerous, but one of them is the perception, at least, that it does not completely uh, replace the missing thyroid. And many patients have the idea that no matter what the blood tests show and how 
normal they seem to be. Some patients at least don't feel normal. And so that's something else that uh, that plays into this. And then the third thing is um, the avoidance of radiation. As you know, radioactive iodine is uh, you know a very effective treatment, but there is the, the idea that your body is being exposed to radiation. And for some people, um, it's just a non-starter when they hear about that. Plus, we know that there can be effects on thyroid eye disease after radioactive iodine. And there's also exposure of the body to radiation, which in some studies has suggested that maybe there may be a slightly increased risk of cancer. And then surgery is always you know, a very outstanding treatment. I have a co-panelists here that are all surgeons, so I, they, I have to say that, But and it's very effective. But again, it's major surgery, and there are complications, potentially, although rare, and um, also is lifelong lead, need for levothyroxine. Again, there are certain indications for why surgery would be the best choice for people. We can get into that later, perhaps. So anyway, most people choose antithyroid drugs. And uh, to answer the rest of your question, it used to be the, uh, the the perception that you, what you would do would be to give the drug for 18 to 24 months and then monitor the uh, anti-TSH receptor antibodies. And if they were still there, you'd say, oh, well, you failed treatment. Uh, the antibodies are still there. You're not in remission. Now we have to try something else. Or we would give the medicine for 18 to 24 months. The antibodies might be negative. We would stop it. And then you know a year or two later, the person would be hyperthyroid again. And we go, oh, well, you've had a relapse. Now you know, you can't go back on methimazole, you need to try something else more definitive. Now, there is a movement afoot here in the United States and elsewhere, and it's not even a new idea, really, to give methimazole for a protracted period of time, so-called long-term antithyroid drug therapy, much in the way that we give people medicines to treat their blood pressure or cholesterol. And a person can take methimazole for, you know, decades, really, uh, there are no long-term effects of methimazole. Yes, there are side effects, allergic reactions that occur in the first 90 days of taking the medicine. But once a person's been on the medicine for a year or two, uh, any kind of adverse reaction would be almost unheard of. So there are people that take the medicine and they're kind of committed to being on it for a long period of time. Um, how long that is, is, is you know, dependent on the patient. But I, I recently saw a patient who's been on it for 27 years. Uh, and, you know, doing fine. So anyway, I, that, I don't know if that answers the whole question, but um, that's all I have to say right now about, about what you asked me. Great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Doc, Dr. Cooper. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Kells. Um, what patients are good candidates for surgery? And if a patient is not sure about having surgery, can they still have a consultation with a surgeon like you? And what would that entail? Um, well, uh, thank you uh, for asking that question. I um, I sort of want to lead with the second question first, uh, because the short answer is, if you're considering um, getting treated for a condition where there's a medical or a surgical option, and you're not sure what you prefer, absolutely, you should meet with a surgeon. And you should meet with the medical specialist that uh, provides care in that domain as well, because you should get a balanced presentation of the risks and benefits of both treatments from the specialists who are the ones who administer each treatment. So um, if you have Graves' disease and you're not sure if you wanna have an operation, you should absolutely go see a surgeon who specializes in thyroid surgery, preferably one even who does a lot of uh, surgery for Graves' disease, because there can be some nuances that you might want to consider, um, and they would be the right person to, you know, be able to ask all of your questions and provide answers that will give you the information you need to make an informed decision. So that, I'm going to leave Emily with that answer, if that's okay. Dr. Shin, I hope that's okay. Um, the next question, which was your first question, is who is a good candidate for surgery? And, you know, I think Dr. Cooper said it nicely when he said it's a very personal decision. So are there are some relative contraindications to radioactive iodine treatment, um, you know, depending upon how much somebody's smoking, that may be something that people want to consider an alternative treatment rather than radioactive iodine. Um, <clears throat> there are people who have social situations with little kids at home that they just can't avoid being around them for the five days that might be required with radioactive iodine treatment. So those would be good people if they wanted definitive treatment to get off the antithyroid drugs to consider surgery. 
Other reasons to consider surgery, um, aside from just a patient preference for that type of treatment, would be if you have a very, very large thyroid, uh, surgery will probably be um, a, a desirable treatment for you. If there's any concerns for thyroid cancer, surgery would be the preferred treatment. If you have other neck problems like hyperparathyroidism or um, multiple large nodules that are causing um, symptoms, those would be good indications to consider surgery because it would treat the hyperthyroidism associated with the Graves and also treat the other uh, pathology at the same time. And then the other um, big category of patients that I think of who should consider surgery are those who need a timely treatment. So um, sometimes people who are considering getting uh, pregnant within six months or um, people whose hyperthyroidism is so poorly controlled that it's uh, you know, really posing a, a danger to their life, um, surgery is a preferred treatment in those settings as well, especially uh, you know, if you have airway compromised, surgery is also something to consider. Um, and then the final group of people that I think um, I see for Graves' disease are people who have had prior radioactive iodine and have recurrent disease. Um, and so they are also people to consider for surgery. And, and when a person chooses surgery, surgery is usually uh, they feel it was a very good decision to make. Thank you, Dr. Kells. Um, Dr. Sharma, we'll go to you next. What are the risks of thyroid surgery for Graves' disease and should patients seek a high volume thyroid surgeon or someone as Dr. Kells mentioned, who specializes in Graves? What's the value in that for the patient? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the ES and the moderators for this opportunity um, and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is complications. Um, I'm a, I tend to run in the area of quality and this is directly addressing that issue, what is the quality of this operation? And that it's ten, it tends to be varied. And that is something that needs to be um, you know, in, in the patient's um, front of their mind of what, what causes that. And so we, we tend to see a, a different set of complications and volume of complications uh, based upon volume of thyroidectomy performed by the surgeon or the center. And these complications can range from very simple, um, you know, non-acute issues to things that are inherently related to thyroid surgery, which are bleeding, uh, voice issues, um, low calcium or hypoparathyroidism, and on rare occasions, thyroid storm. And the good thing is that almost all of these can be mitigated uh, depending on surgical technique and the experience of the surgeon. Uh, there are some adjuncts also uh, that go along with uh, minimizing complications like nerve monitoring, uh, appropriate uh, parathyroid hormone monitoring after surgery to determine if the patient needs more calcium or less. Um, and these are things that uh, you know vary according to the experience, and Dr. Kell said it appropriately, it isn't just that the surgeon is experienced in thyroid surgery, but also in grave surgery. This tends to be a uh, larger gland, it tends to be more vascular, and it tends to result in often in a higher level of complications. But again, all of these are mitigated in the hands of the surgeon and the right surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, the volume that is often talked about in the world of total thyroidectomy is about 25 cases a year. And from a center standpoint, this volume tends to be about 100 cases a year. And there's some very good data out there that shows that once you reach these thresholds of 25 for a surgeon and 100 for the center, you tend to mitigate complications by almost order of magnitude. And I think that's an important consideration uh, whenever approaching uh, a surgeon or approaching a center uh, for thyroidectomy. Great, thank you. We're going to shift our focus to Dr. Douglas. Um, so the question is, for patients with Gray's eye disease, when is thyroidectomy preferable to RAI? And can you highlight the differences between mild, moderate, and severe eye disease, and if there's any interactions with smoking in particular? Well, I just want to thank you. Um, it's really a a great knowledge uh, for me to interact uh, with this group um, because I, I usually say everything I don't know, I send to either my endocrine friends or my endocrinology surger, surgeons. So, so really appreciate being here. So we'll start with the, the general question of mild, moderate, and severe. So we think of thyroid eye disease, and it's important to remember that thyroid eye disease is really a facial disease, but we focus mostly upon the eyes. 
And it's an expansive tissue disease that occurs mostly behind the eyes of both the extraocular muscles, actually more precisely the cells in between the extraocular muscles and the fat. And that causes an expansion in a contained environment. And that contained environment is called the orbit. It's kind of like if you have too much ice cream in an ice cream cone, it starts to overflow. Well, what happens in mild disease is that you have an autoimmune attack of some of the periorbital tissues around the eyes, and it causes a little bit of eyelid retraction, maybe a little bit of swelling. Um, and that's usually, you know, the patients can deal with that, both symptomatically when it causes dry eye, maybe some blurry vision, redness, but usually they can use artificial tears, things like that to overcome those symptom problems, but also the symptomatic issues, but also to um, see that the facial changes tend to be mild and maybe even remitting. And approximately 40 to 50% of patients will be in that mild category. Moderate and moderate severe is a little bit more tissue expansion, especially behind the eye. Now you start to get where the eye is bulging there may be some double vision involved where the muscle is affected and not allowing proper movement of the eyes or, or coordinated movement of the eyes causing two, two images. And you can imagine driving on the highway and how you know, disconcerting that can be. And those symptoms are harder to manage. Patients start to get up very early in the morning because sometimes the symptoms will go away in a few hours. Their friends, everyone starts to notice this disease. The eye drops don't work as well, et cetera. And the moderate and moderate severe disease are predominantly patients who may either seek a medical or surgical treatment in the future. Severe disease is strictly defined as vision-threatening disease. And that tends to be a relative medical emergency in that the tissue behind the eye has expanded so much that it's cutting off the blood supply to the optic nerve and actually reducing vision. And those patients need to see, be seen urgently um, and treated much more urgently. There is a definitive link of smoking, and it's really the only factor that we can alter immediately upon me seeing a patient in the, in the exam uh, room, that if you stop smoking, you will have on average less severe disease, you will be more responsive to therapy, um, and the disease will likely have a much shorter course. In fact, sometimes when patients stop smoking, I can't even recognize them in a few months because they've had such a dramatic improvement of their disease over that period of time simply by stopping and smoking. And the one thing that no patient should be <laughs> left alone to, to make sure that they're not smoking. And then finally, thyroidectomy versus radioactive iodine and even versus methimazole. It's not an argument I get into with my patients, or, or, but I do approach it as a discussion. And, and I urge it's a discussion for them to approach with my colleagues who are on, on this webinar. It's like, look, you know, go and talk to, this is Dr. Cooper saying, don't talk to your endocrinologist and an endocrine surgeon. This is not my area of expertise, but I think they'll be able to convey to you the pros and cons. My only area where I do have a bit more um, say in, is if they have moderate to severe disease and they're looking for radioactive iodine, I know that that is going to cause, potentially cause a flare of their eye disease, anywhere from 10 to 50%. And that may be hard to control. That may push them into optic neuropathy, push them into requiring surgery. So in those cases, I will steer away from radioactive iodine. Uh, in those much more uh, significant cases. If it's mild and if it feels that it's appropriate, radioactive eye is the most appropriate treatment, I have no problem treating the eyes to make sure that everything goes well if that's the most appropriate treatment. It, you know, so it's just that one circumstance. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Um, Dr. Cooper, does Graves' disease resolve after thyroidectomy? Um, is there anything else patients have to worry about after surgery with regards to the autoimmune component? Well, patients often ask, well, now that I've had my thyroid removed, do I still have Graves' disease? And it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, we, 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 the Graves' disease is defined by having antibodies that cause the thyroid to grow and to be making too much thyroid hormone. They're called thyroid stimulating antibodies or thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. And it turns out that after surgery, these antibody levels tend to go away. 
And the same thing happens after uh, methimazole therapy too. In many cases, they tend to go away, whereas they actually go up after radioactive iodine therapy. So if a person, let's just take a person who had surgery, they're doing fine on their levothyroxine replacement therapy. It's now a year or two later and uh, they feel well and their thyroid function tests are normal and you measure the antibodies and they're not there. They're normal. They're zero. I would say to that person, yes, you have been cured of your Graves' disease. You do not have Graves' disease anymore. Well, I mean, because what, how else do you define Graves' disease? They don't have any evidence of, of this autoimmune disease that they used to have. The same thing could be happened, could be made, case could be made for a person who's on antithyroid drugs after 10 years and you stop the medicine, their antibodies are negative, and then they do fine and they're fine for the rest of their lives. They don't have Graves' disease anymore as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, I, I think that should answer the question, at least in my view. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that, you know, we have, fortunately, we have great antithyroid medications for patients with Graves' disease. However, um, we definitely can offer definitive treatment with RAI or surgery, you know, much sooner than the 18 to 24 months period of having antithyroid medicine. So just going back to Dr. Kells, I think you mentioned a few circumstances where patients would want to pursue definitive treatment earlier on, such as being pregnant or things like that. Are there any other um, you know, circumstances that you would offer a patient with definitive therapy? Um, so you mean in the, like acutely? Acutely, instead of, you know, instead of being on antithyroid medicine for a long time, you would, def you would defer to more definitive patients therapy like surgery or radioactive iodine treatment? Yeah. So I think um, the first thing, which I think Dr. Cooper mentioned early on is patient preference. So if a patient really just wants to pursue definitive treatment earlier on in their course, then I think that's a patient worth having a conversation with uh, both, again, the endocrinologist and the surgeon. Um, a lot of times we get consults for patients that are admitted to the hospital in thyroid storm. Um, and this is an, an acute critical a problem where the patient may even have like heart failure. It can be very dramatic. Um, sometimes it requires hospitalization and they didn't even know that they had Graves' disease. It's their first presentation, let's say, of, um, of hyperthyroidism and they're diagnosed with Graves' disease. And frequently if that person is um, you know, too sick to leave the hospital um, or if they can't be controlled, then in that situation, we'll often consider surgery. Um, as a treatment during the hospitalization. And it can be, you know, I don't want to call it harrowing, but when you care about your patient, you know, they're extremely frail and sick at the time of the acute disease. And so you really work together with the team, the entire team that's taking care of the patient um, to try to ensure uh, a, safe, uh, a safe operation and, a, and a, an uneventful recovery. And then they'll, they'll often see the end organ damage, like their heart failure or whatever will go away, which is incredibly dramatic to, uh, to see. Great. And just one other question for you, Dr. Kells. Um, after surgery, what medications do you usually start patients on right away? And how long will you monitor these patients um, before you know, handling, you know, handing them off to their primary care physician or an endocrinologist? So, um, it depends a little bit about uh, how they are preoperatively. So if somebody comes into the operating room, you thyroid with normal thyroid function uh, studies at the time of the operation, then we'll frequently start them on a weight-based dosing of thyroid hormone replacement immediately after surgery. However, a lot of patients with Graves' disease are still um, you know, hyperthyroid as measured by their TSH at the time that they come uh, to their operation. And you know, we work to get their heart rate under control and make it a safe experience for them. But for those patients, we'll either start them on a very low dose of Synthroid and then work up over the course of the upcoming week to 10 days to a weight-based dose, or we just send them home knowing that their body has already made enough thyroid hormone for them. We stop their antithyroid drugs, and then about a week later, we'll start them on their thyroid hormone replacement. Um, and in those patients, they're often on a beta blocker or something like that for heart rate control before surgery also. And that we actually leave on and it gets weaned off over the couple of weeks following surgery. Um, the, as to the question of how long I follow people after surgery, a lot of that is very local, um, you know, to the area where you are and what the practice patterns are in the uh, health system where you're seeking care. 
So our, um, we work very much in concert and we talk all the time between the endocrinologist, the endocrine surgeon, the primary care doctor, the endocrine surgeon, the primary care doctor, the endocrinologist. And so I see the patients back in the office about two to three weeks after surgery. If they're having any issues with transient hypocalcemia or any, anything that they're concerned about, then I'll see them back again. Um, if they feel a lot of times they feel better than they have felt in a long time, quite frankly. And as long as they are feeling well and there's no evidence of any concerns and they have scheduled follow-up with the endocrinologist or the primary care doctor, you know, I tell them they don't have to waste their time coming back to see me. I'm always happy to see them, but please just reach out. And, you know, I, I fit people in all the time. So if they have a, a more urgent or acute issue that they want to see me sooner, they don't have to wait six months to see me just because they didn't sign up for a post, you know, a second post-op visit. So it's usually, I see them about two or three weeks after surgery, and then they transition their care back over to the um, endocrinologist or the primary care doctor. Thank you, Dr. Kells. Um, Dr. Sharma, back to you. Can you discuss some of the recovery after thyroidectomy? Um, how quickly can someone expect to get back to work, exercise, and all their normal, like, normal routine? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Shen, for that question. I think um, Almost like other thyroidectomies, you know, the acute period is not too bad in the grand scheme of uh, surgeries and that happen, uh, but it's still a surgery, and so it still has some side effects. I think uh, most commonly, the post-operative instructions are one to two weeks of light activity. After that, uh, you you can resume almost everything. Uh, there is a, a small group of patients who tend to actually feel very better very quickly after a thyroidectomy, especially if they were hyperthyroid significantly a few weeks before. And we will see those changes in the first 30 days. Uh, patients tend to have about 20 to 25% patient, of patients tend to have some temporary voice changes. These are often recovered in the first 30 days. There's a small group of patients who will linger a little bit longer, uh, but the overall uh, voice quality has come back to almost 80, 90% in those first few weeks. And then there's, you know, the key things are the calcium. And that sometimes is something that can linger in about, again, 25 to 30% of patients, even for a month. And that tends to be the only medication that you're additionally taking. There's minimal narcotic requirements and other things for a thyroidectomy of this sort. Most of the time we're treating this with uh, Tylenol or ibuprofen equivalents, and uh, obviously the levothyroxine. So patients are feeling better. Now, uh, especially if they've been very symptomatic, compressive symptoms and other things, uh, and many patients are almost back to normal within 30 days. And the good thing is that this is something that, you know, we expect for other thyroidectomies also. So once the operation has been done, the pipeline post for recovery is very similar to other thyroid operations. Um, less activity for a couple of weeks, expect back to almost 100% within 30 days. And then are there any special medications you have the patients taking before surgery in preparation besides their antithyroid medicine? Uh, sometimes. I mean, uh, there are, uh, I don't use it routinely, but there are a small group of patients, which you have very large glands that we tend to put on potassium iodide drops. It's not something I use routinely in, our, in my practice. And often patients are on beta blockade. Almost everybody gets some level of steroids uh, around the perioperative time period. And those are often for nausea, but also uh, it helps with some of the post-op recovery. Uh, there's really nothing else uh, that's really needed. Uh, and most of those are stopped after surgery. Thank you. Um, Dr. Douglas, another quick question for you. Um, is there any risk of eye disease flaring back up after thyroidectomy? And how does that compare to radioactive iodine? Yeah. So, so it's very interesting, uh, you know, there's, there's no definitive risk difference um, for getting eye disease, um, just a theoretical difference where a thyroidectomy may be slightly beneficial as far as protective against, uh, thyroid, against eye disease and radioactivity may be slightly more prone to developing eye disease. But these are from a mix of studies um, not a prospective study. So right now, as far as getting eye disease, any of the three treatments are, you know, interchangeable from my standpoint. There, there appears to be very little risk from thyroidectomy of getting eye disease. And in fact, 
for many of my patients, good control of their thyroid function, whether that be with a thyroidectomy or however that is achieved, can dramatically improve their eye disease in, in a small percentage of patients. But there certainly does not appear to be any negative effect of, of treatment of the thyroid with a thyroidectomy in regards to the eye, eye symptomatology or with changes. To tag on to that, Dr. Douglas, um, I think you briefly mentioned um, this, but for patients with severe eye disease, um, can you discuss what eye procedures may be needed and the timing and order of the eye surgery and the thyro and thyroidectomy? Yeah, so, so for in regards to thyroidectomy, I will typically talk to my to the endocrine their endocrine surgeon um, and determine what what peril are they in, you know, is, is it because of heart rate, you know, what timing is appropriate for the thyroidectomy? I've done them as close as the same day, almost jointly, and I've done them as far apart as, as you want them to be. So I'm completely flexible in doing any kind of eye procedure, so to speak, with a thyroidectomy. We're also in a changing landscape right now where we have really some pioneering medications that are now being used for optic neuropathy, even for severe disease that can be obtained um, even without authorization, but for urgent use within 48 hours that have been shown that typically can reverse severe eye disease, usually in about uh, two days, which is, which is quite substantial. And if it has to be sooner than that, which is very unusual to have a rapidly developing eye disease that has to be treated with even sooner than that, surgery is possible. And for surgery, what we do is we actually make more room of that ice cream cone. We actually punch out an area of that ice cream cone in a very uh, conceptually simplistic manner into the sinuses in this case to allow blood flow and to allow decompression of that nerve, of the optic nerve that's been squeezed of its blood supply. Medically, we can also achieve that um, quite well. And we're, we're having, uh, you know, we're in a time of change, I think, as far as in the next few years of how we'll treat those severe patients, whether that becomes primarily medically or, or uh, continues with a large surgical interventions. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Cooper, we learned about some new information about a possible link between COVID vaccination or infection and developing Graves' disease. Um, are patients with Graves' disease at a higher risk of getting sick with COVID? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, it's really interesting uh, that what's been observed, people who have, uh, so just to step back a minute, uh, when the pandemic started and people were very anxious about COVID and getting vaccinated, there was the concern that people who have quote unquote autoimmune diseases may be more susceptible to getting COVID or may the, the, uh, shouldn't get vaccinated. Um, and that just is not true. So anybody who has an autoimmune disease should get vaccinated. There's no reason not to. And they're not more susceptible to getting COVID. But what has emerged uh, over the last couple of years in a number of reports is the observation that a whole host of autoimmune diseases seems to be triggered by either getting COVID or getting vaccinated. And it's true also with thyroid disease. So there are now studies where they've looked at, you know, the incidence of Graves' disease over the last 10 years annually in Spain. And it turns out just in the last year, there was just an uptick in the frequency of Graves' disease in Spain, and it's been attributed to COVID and, uh, or the vaccine. And then there are other reports where people um, have gotten vaccinated, and then lo and behold, two months later, they have Graves' disease. But it's not just Graves' disease, it's all thyroid diseases. So there's a higher frequency of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, there's a higher frequency of silent thyroiditis, which is a variant of Hashimoto's, and also there's a higher frequency of subacute or viral thyroiditis, and that's probably due to direct COVID infection of the thyroid. So the answer to your question is, Yes, there's been a, a whole host of uh, observations that getting COVID or getting vaccinated may lead to an uptick in the risk of the population or people who get the disease or the vaccination having uh, um, Graves' disease onset or a recurrence of Graves' disease that it's been in remission. But I just want to make it clear that 
regardless of what happens to the person, they should get vaccinated. That is the most essential thing. You should not, if you have, if you're in remission from Graves' disease, let's say, and there are reports where people have a relapse after they get vaccinated, that's not a reason not to get vaccinated. I mean, that's the most important thing. I just want to emphasize that again. Yes, there may be a rare risk of some thyroid problem happening after a vaccination, or, but that's not a reason to withhold your, your, yourself or your family from getting vaccinated. Great, thank you, Dr. Cooper. Um, Dr. Kells, what medical treatment is needed to get a patient ready for thyroid surgery for Greer disease um, in terms of controlling thyroid function tests and heart rate? <clears throat> Sorry, I had a, some weird sound came across my thing, probably from an email. Was that directed to me? Yes, Dr. Kels. Okay, so um, what medications are needed to get somebody prepared for thyroid in, surgery? In terms of, you know, norm, you know, making them use thyroid, controlling the heart rate. Yes, so um, there are two conditions in which people are getting ready for surgery for Graves' disease. One is when they're acutely ill in the hospital that we were just talking about. And in that setting, there might be a different set of um, medications that are used versus somebody who is at home and being treated for Graves' disease and is under pretty good control. So I just want to, you know, differentiate those two uh, patient populations. So let's start with the uh, the latter first. So somebody's at home, they've been on their antithyroid medications. That's one of the drugs that is appropriate to treat uh, patients with Graves' disease. Um, and they may be on a beta blocker. So something like metoprolol um, is a beta blocker that's frequently used. Um, and if they are well controlled with a normal heart rate um, and their uh, free thyroxine uh, levels are controlled, even if their TSH is still abnormal, that's adequate preparation for surgery. If they have a large gland, especially if they don't have nodules, we'll frequently also use something called SSKI or an alternative similar drug called Lugol solution, because those medications can help decrease the amount of blood flow in a Graves uh, thyroid that is often uh, very uh, engorged um, and can also decrease the peripheral conversion of uh, the thyroid hormone to the active metabolite, make uh, surgery potentially a little bit safer. So we'll frequently use that in patients um, who have Graves disease before surgery, especially if they're not under perfect control with their antithyroid meds um, and their beta blocker. In the acute setting, uh, we sometimes resort to some other types of drugs um, because it's uh, uh, frequently um, steroids will be used um, to help try to get some control and um, occasionally cholestyramine is also used as well. Thank you, Dr. Kells. Um, Dr. Sharma, what's your experience with patients' quality of life after thyroidectomy for Graves' disease? I think it's uh, really interesting, uh, that question. I think we uh, go back about 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of data. Um, but because of Graves' disease, and I think possibly the impact that hyperthyroidism has, this, this area has, has been actively studied in the last 10 years. Um, there's, there are randomized control trials and quality of life studies that exist out there. And invariably, all of them show a return to normal. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to many of us who see Gabe Graves patients, actually an improvement in quality of life within 30 days. And especially if you measure six months, there's a significant improvement in quality of life. These were studies that were done through using you know, wellness scores, cognitive uh, scores, and SF36 type uh, overall functioning scores. And there's a smaller group of patients like adolescent patients who have had significant cognitive impairment, um, failing high school. And we see these type of improvements within 30 to 45 days of surgery in patients with Graves' disease. Perhaps it's because of the antibody mediation and other things that were discussed. Uh, we don't exactly know the cause or perhaps it's just control of hyperthyroidism, but we actually see improvement in quality of life. And that's one of the best areas and promising areas of why a thyroidectomy may be more advantageous uh, especially a total thyroidectomy. And I think we haven't gotten into that, the, that discussion today of whether total or subtotal, but in general, most of us do total thyroidectomies and we tend to see improvements. So just to tag on to that, Dr. Sharma, when would you consider doing a lobectomy for Graves' disease versus a total? I, I would not. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, there's, 
the disease is a diffuse uh, overall gland disease. I think a lobectomy would definitely not be an appropriate operation. There were times when surgeons were pursuing subtotal thyroidectomy, which was essentially leaving a small remnant. Uh, the goals of that operation at one time were to avoid levothyroxine use and you know, perhaps an, a, an appropriate goal, uh, but in the modern era, probably not. And also there's a chance of recurrence of hypothyroidism when you do a subtotal thyroidectomy. And that's also been demonstrated in, in, uh, in uh, data very well. The complication profile is almost the same, whether you do a subtotal th uh, thyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy. So I think most of us would agree who are on the call and do this all the time and are part of the AES that a total thyroidectomy is the appropriate operation for, for Graves patient. Agree. Um, okay, Dr. Douglas, I have a question for you. Um, what's your experience with Tepeza? Can you discuss the side effects, success rate, and insurance coverage? Yeah, so we've, um, we actually have the most experience, um, I believe, in the world uh, with Tepeza. Um, we published the, uh, the phase uh, two and three trials uh, from the, the medication. <clears throat> and it's important to know that Tepeza is a specific molecule that binds to the receptors that are overexpressed in the, um, on the essentially the tissue and fibroblasts around the eyes. And it causes a change in their metabolism in addition to a change in the inflammatory potential. So Tepeza in both the clinical trials and in concept um, shrinks the cells that actually are, are associated with this disease causing the expansion, both not only behind the eye, but around the face. So it actually changes the tissues. The one thing I cannot do as a surgeon, I can't change the tissue back to normal. Um, I can't turn linen in, back into lycra, but I can take away tissue. But what, what Tepeza does is it actually changes the consistency of the tissue, causes that to shrink by blocking the IGF-1 receptor. Now, um, whenever you block a, a receptor that is present on other cells, there can certainly be side effects. But Tepeza in about 85% of patients has been shown to be effective at reducing the eye bulging and the swelling associated with the eyes. Um, it was originally shown to be an active patient so less than one year, but now there are many studies showing that even up to seven, eight years, because of its metabolic potential, it still um, is, seems to be just as effective and providing anywhere from three to four millimeters reduction in proptosis, which is considerable com comparable to what I get in a decompression. Um, many of these patients, about 93% are long-term, meaning once you go through a Tepeza infusion, a series of eight, 93% will have long-term res results, but about 7% do get a reactivation. They may need another course or they may need a, additional treatment. So it's something to bear in mind with that percentage. The patients to watch out for and Tepeza side effects are the very commonly asked questions. One is, there's about a 10% chance of worsening of diabetes. I follow these patients very carefully with endocrinologists. I obtain a hemoglobin A1C prior, in addition to glucose, in addition to talking to their endocrinologist, looking for any kind of latent uh, diabetes that might bear itself during Tepeza treatment. And these patients need to be followed. Um, older patients really need to be followed pretty carefully. Um, there are hearing changes. We just did a very large study looking at hearing associated effects with Tepeza. And if there is a baseline audiogram is really vital because if there are any high frequency changes and hearing de deficits that are detected, those patients are at increased risk of having potentially even prolonged hearing deficits associated with Tepeza. That can be largely predicted. So it's very, very important. Um, the patients to avoid would be at least um, incredibly careful with would be diabetics, but also any patient who has a history of ulcerative colitis. You know, like any medication, this has provided us for the first time an alternative to a very invasive surgery for patients. And I present both a medical and a surgical option. It may not, may or may not be appropriate for you know, for these, you know, for an individual patient, but in general, it, it, it has widened our scope and our field, you know, tremendously, uh, you know, certainly for patients to think about. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. And, and while we're talking about eye needs, 
Um, earlier, we, we talked with our endocrine surgeons about how to find a thyroid surgeon, but can you tell us a little bit about the credentials of an oculoplastic specialist and how can our Graves patients seek out expertise close to home? What should they be looking for? Yeah, it, it's it's not easy, but it, it comes back to what Dr. Sharma was, was recommending. It's all about um, how many numbers, how, how many patients you see with thyroid eye disease. You should first start with an oculoplastic surgeon. And there's a group um, called ASOPRS, A-S-O-P-R-S, which has a physician finder. It's, you know, the Society of Oculoplastic Surgeons. And that's a great start because within 50 miles, I think we've we've done the, the math, you can find an oculoplastic surgeon anywhere in the United States. So, but what the next question is really important is how often do you treat thyroid eye disease? What do you, you know, how many of your patients come in? Because many oculoplastic surgeons can do just purely cosmetic treatments or, or various other treatments. So it's really vital to ask them what percentage of their practice, you know, you know, is thyroid eye disease. And one key question that usually helps to determine this is how many decompressions do you do per year? It, and I would agree with Dr. Sharma, if you're doing 20 or 25 decompressions a year, that's a reasonable number. That's a number that is, you know, something that any surgeon would feel comfortable moving forward. If you're doing one or two, that, that would put me a bit at unease, um, only because you may or may not, uh, you know, be seeing those patients quite at that frequency. But those, that would be the series of questions that, you know, you could consider. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooper, we have a, a new question. Have you ever had experience dealing with Graves' disease and twins? So the question is, how can twins both get Graves' disease as, um, as this has occurred here and have a vastly mm -hmm. different response to treatment? Have you ever had experience with that? Um, <laughs> I can't say that I have. Um, but it certainly wouldn't be unexpected. We know that the predisposition to getting any autoimmune disease, including Graves' disease, is uh, genetic. And so, you know, when we take a family history, it's just so typical. Well, you know, is there anyone in your family with thyroid problems? Oh yes, my mother, her mother, my aunt, her cousin, you know, that kind of thing. We just see typically a family just riddled with thyroid problems, both hyper and hypothyroidism. And so since I don't sure if the, question is about identical twins or fraternal twins, but certainly they share a lot of genes in common. And so it wouldn't be expect, unexpected at all for twins or siblings to get Graves disease, maybe not exactly at the same time, but you know, it's possible, I guess, that they can get it at the same time, because one of the, we don't know really why people get Graves disease at any particular time. In other words, why, when someone shows up at age 25 with Graves disease, why is it now rather than when they're 35 or 45 or and one of the things that um, has been noticed for a long, long time in the literature is that stress can trigger Graves' disease in a susceptible person who's susceptible genetically. And I don't mean stress like, oh, my, you know, I had a flat tire yesterday, but a real severe psychic stress, a death in the family, a divorce, the diagnosis of breast cancer, you know, some really bad thing seems to, not in everybody, I mean, in some people, everything's just been great, and no, no stresses at all, but sometimes stress is clearly an event that can incite this, and so if there are twins that have it, maybe they had the same stress, I mean, maybe their parent died, or that, that sort of thing, so yes, it's certainly very possible that you could see that. Now, why one would respond more than the other, or one better to medicine than the other, you know, that I, I can't say. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Another question for you from our Facebook group. Does thyroid surgery or any of the other treatments for Graves' disease impact testosterone produ production for our male patients? No. I, and then, I could be pretty definitive about that, no. Good. And then <laughs> are there any other alternative treatments that patients could seek out, um, you know, going gluten-free, any lifestyle changes that may be able to impact um, their Graves' disease and make it go away or increase their likelihood of remission? Um, I think, as has been said by other people, uh, the most important thing in terms of lifestyle is smoking cessation. And um, 
I think smoking in general has decreased in the United States over the last couple of decades, but it's certainly common in Europe still and in Asia, places like India and China. And so um, we in the, in the United States, I can ask Dr. Douglas maybe to comment on this, but I think we've seen a decline over time in the severity of thyroid eye disease. Um, and I think some people attribute that to the fact that the United States population is smoking less. But other than that, in terms of lifestyle, I can't, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, back to you, Dr. Douglas, quick question. Um, we have a patient who says, how do, you, um, how do you deal with eye symptoms, such as tearing, pain, and swelling? Yeah, so tearing is typically due to eye dryness. Now that, that sounds, you know, uh, paradoxical, right? But what's happening is you can think about smelling an onion and what's the first thing that happens is your eye gets irritated and you start to tear. And those are reflex tearing. So when my patients come in and say, I'm tearing all the time, it's because their eyes are getting dry. They're getting dry because they're out of the wind. They're getting dry because they're bulging. They're getting dry because their eyelids actually may or may not even close at night. So the first thing is lubrication for their eyes before the tearing starts. You have to prevent it. Once it starts, it, you kind of have to let it run its course for the next hour or so. But tearing is always due to dryness, and, and that can be worse because these people blink less. They don't close their eyes. The symptoms such as swelling, um, which occurs primarily above the eyes and below the eyes, that typically is worse in the morning. There aren't a lot of great ways around that. You know, there are medical treatments, but I assume, you know, we're talking about beyond just Tepeza and steroids, et cetera. Those do help with that quite a bit. But in the milder cases, what you can do is if you play, if you sleep and you place your head slightly above your heart, even putting a little brick or something under the head post of the bed, it will allow that swelling to be just a little less. The other thing is really watch your salt intake because salt will dramatically make the under eye bags much worse. Some patients will even wear a little bit of tape underneath their eyes, um, you know, and try to compress that. It doesn't work as well for the upper eyelids, but certainly works a little bit better for the lower eyelids. It's very similar to swelling that occurs because a lot of patients will wake up with double vision. They'll get up an hour or two early in the morning and just sit or stand so that the, their swelling will go down and their double vision will go down so they can drive to work. Well, what happens is when you put your head above your heart, you tend to, over you know, a period of time, tend to reduce some of that swelling. So those are some of the tricks. They're, they're not easy. They're not foolproof but they do help. The last thing I don't do is I don't ever prescribe patients, you know, diuretics or, or other things like that. That That's only going to compound problems uh, enormously. And I guess um, directed to either Dr. Cooper or um, Dr. Douglas, are there any other additional treatments on the horizon, whether it's antibody treatments in addition to Tepeza for eye disease or um, immunologic therapies for just the hyperthyroidism to begin with? Sure, I'll, I'll just tackle the, the Graves' disease part. Um, so as I said at the very beginning, the treatments we have do not address the underlying cause of Graves' disease. And there's been a lot of research now um, trying to get at that initial cause, which is the antibodies that are stimulating the thyroid. So there are trials now and uh, uh, drugs that are being used to block the TSH receptor, which is what the antibody binds to. There are trials that are used that are uh, investigating lowering of the antibody levels by inhibiting uh, what are called B cells that make antibodies. There's a drug called rituximab that is used to treat other diseases that has some promise in Graves' disease as well. And um, there are other drugs that are used to inhibit uh, the formation of other kinds of antibodies in general that overall may have a, an effect on, on the eye uh, and on Graves' disease itself. And I know that Dr. Douglas um, is aware of many other treatments besides Tempeza that are used um, in other countries that don't have Tempeza to treat thyroid eye disease, like high doses of steroids and other less uh, well-used drugs, like rituximab is another one. 
And I think on the horizon, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are other drugs that are like Tempeza that other drug companies are working on that work like that or in other similar ways that will be on the horizon as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're running no less than five clinical trials currently um, on many of these me mechanisms. Several of them are on drugs that are very similar. They're antibodies to the IGF-1 receptor that may be delivered in different ways, subcutaneously, et cetera. There's even an oral dose trial that's actually designed to inhibit um, one of the productions of IGF-1. Uh, Dr. Cooper mentioned the anti-TSH receptor medications. And then there's ones that we already know about, uh, potential IL-17 inhibitors, um, IL-6 receptor inhibitors. The, the, the kind of the, the thyroid eye disease um, itself has kind of now become much more uh, aware both for clinicians and for patients seeking treatment. So, so I think that there will be a whole host of new therapies very soon, um, but certainly there are quite a few trials already underway. Dr. Shen, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, we have a few minutes, um, just a minute or two. So I just wanted to see if um, either Dr. Sharma or Dr. Kells had any last comments on you know, the surgical treatment of Graves, any comments? Uh, I appreciate that. I think uh, we've, you know, once the decision to pursue thyroidectomy has been done, there are probably some things that patients need to be aware of and goes again towards mitigating complications. And there have been some changes in technology. Um, one of them is around parathyroid viability. Uh, parathyroid viability has a lot to do with one of the complications of Graves' disease, which is hypocalcemia. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of new adjuncts out there that actually can evaluate uh, how the parathyroid is functioning, uh, whether it's vascular, whether it's working uh, intraoperatively. And I think that's an important adjunct for patients to be aware of from a safety standpoint. And the other is something that we've we talked a little bit about, which is nerve monitoring. And I think nerve monitoring is something that many of us use, particularly with Graves' cases. Uh, where if we do see a change in signal, we can actually stage, stage, stage this operation. We don't have to do the entire thyroidectomy at one time. It's a very rare occurrence for most of us who do this all the time, but there are cases where we do see changes in nerve signals uh, while we're operating. That's a good time sometimes to actually halt the operation, come back, let that voice nerve recover, and then do the other side. So I think just from a patient awareness standpoint, as they're evaluating surgeons or they're evaluating centers to look at those two issues in particular. Thank you. Dr. Kells, any last comment? Never be afraid to ask uh, questions of your surgeon um, or your endocrinologist for that matter. I think um, a lot of times people are embarrassed to say like, how many of these operations do you, do you do a year? Or do you treat a lot of patients with Graves' disease? And you know, it's always my opinion that if the surgeon is not willing to answer that question or takes offense, it's probably not the right surgeon for you. Um, so you should feel very comfortable to ask about people's level of experience to make sure you're seeing someone who you can feel comfortable with and who you can trust with your, your medical care. Um, and I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's a personal decision uh, whether or not you want to pursue uh, antithyroid drugs, uh, radioactive iodine or surgery, and uh, you want to make sure you're working with a team that, that hears you and that um, understands your concerns and can uh, steer you in the right direction. Great, thank you. Um, as we approach the top of the hour, we would like to thank our viewers and supporters mm -hmm. for joining us this evening. A special thank you to our expert panelists for taking time out of the busy schedule to answer your questions and to discuss Gray's disease. We also want to thank GDATF for their support. Yes, and thank you again to um, all of our moderators. Um, I think our final points as well from Dr. Kelts and Dr. Sharma were very helpful. Um, but also want to just make sure, as we mentioned, some of the most current operative technology that we'll use in the OR can be adjuncts to your surgeon. Um, those adjuncts don't replace a 
high volume surgeon. And it's really ensuring whether it's your oculoplastics specialist or your thyroid specialist, their individual skill and experience is what's gonna get you safely through the treatment. Um, as a reminder, this session was recorded and will be available on the AAES Facebook page and YouTube channel and uh, more helpful information for patients you can please be sure to visit the AAES patient education website at www.collectedmed.com slash AAES patient education. And this will also be posted as a link in our Facebook live stream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.